More and more of us are going to struggle to outcompete software, artificial intelligence. We have to start evolving. If people want to stay ahead and gain the skills that they need to be on top of their game and their careers, they're going to need to keep learning. Soft skills, how to deal with human behavior and how to adjust to things that are changing in real Power and confidence. Exactly what was going to win, what was going to lose. Anybody can look at their craft, their profession, their, their passion, and become better. Uh, today's topic is the economics of contagious disease, systems thinking for a sustainable future. I am Peter Hopkins, the president and co-founder of Big Think, and I will be moderating today's discussion. Uh, our guest today is the esteemed economist and UN advisor, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. He is university professor and director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia. He is also uh, director of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and he has been an advisor to three UN secretaries general. He's also a New York Times bestselling author, uh, and his books include The Age of Sustainable Development, Building the New American Economy, and A New Foreign Policy Beyond American Exceptionalism. His most recent book, published earlier this year, is The Ages of Globalization, uh, geography, technology, and institutions. Welcome, Dr. Sachs. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much. Now, first off, a little housekeeping. Uh, if you are new to the Big Think Live, uh, uh, today's webinar will last for about 45 minutes. Uh, we'll start with a discussion with Professor Sachs first, followed by audience Q&A. Uh, so please ask your questions in the comments section of whatever platform you are watching on. Uh, you can start sending questions right away, and we will get to them uh, during the Q&A session. Um, our goals for today's session will really be to harness uh, Professor Sachs, his expertise, both as an economist and global policy expert, but also as an educator. Uh, and we're going to look at uh, topics like systems thinking and the models and the modes and the ways the people at the front lines of trying to solve this challenge, whether it's from uh, a public health standpoint or a policy standpoint, how they are thinking about and understanding the challenges. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, let's get started. Professor Sachs, you have had a front row seat in our global battles against most of the scourges of the modern times, AIDS, malaria, TB. Uh, how does the COVID-19 response compare to the others that you've, you've borne witness to? I think this is uh, absolutely uh, extraordinary uh, in the scale of this crisis. Uh, the other diseases you mentioned are huge burdens on uh, health, uh, deaths, uh, and uh, the global population. But uh, COVID-19 is really something that we haven't experienced uh, since the influenza epidemic uh, a century ago. Uh, this is a new disease, a new virus to human beings. It's highly contagious. Uh, there is no existing immunity, as far as we know, in the human population. Uh, and that means that the susceptibility to this virus is essentially universal, as far as we know, biologically. Anyone uh, can contract the illness. It's also uh, a very serious illness. I don't know all of the uh, dimensions of uh, the uh, pathology and uh, its lethality, but it seems that around 1% of those who are infected uh, succumb, uh, die from this virus. Uh, there are debates technically about uh, exactly that number, but it's high, maybe 10 times higher than a bad flu season. Uh, this means that the whole world is disrupted by this virus, since it can spread everywhere. There's no vaccine, there's no effective treatment. Uh, it is something we don't want to get. And uh, the result is that within just a few months, uh, there has been a dramatic change of life across the world. Uh, people in lockdowns, sheltering at home, not going to work. Economies have plummeted in the short term. 
In other words, the scale of disruption is simply something we've not seen in peacetime, at least since uh, the influenza epidemic of 1918, 1919, and that was a devastating epidemic. And here we are again. Now, from an economic perspective, how should we think about, how do the possible outcomes for this pandemic, and you've sort of touched on a couple of them there, you know, if we find a cure, if we find a vaccine, or if we find ourselves in a situation where it's just long-term control and management, how do those different outcomes inform the way we should think about the economics and how to account for them? Well, I think the most important thing to do is to consider different possible outcomes or different scenarios. One scenario is that the epidemic goes through the population relatively uncontrolled, uh, that there is just not effective policy response to it or behavioral response to it. What we know in that case from the characteristics of this virus is that well over half the population would be infected uh, and uh, upwards of 80 or even 90 percent of the population would uh, contract the disease perhaps over a period of a couple of years two or three waves and of those uh, around one percent would die uh, if you do the math that's just devastating uh, the United States, uh, where there are 327 million people, one could imagine more than 250 million people becoming infected. One could imagine, uh, therefore, more than a couple million people dying of this disease. We are right now at 85,000 deaths as of mid-May, but the numbers could obviously soar if this continues uh, in an unabated way. The other scenario is a scenario of suppressing the epidemic, really stopping the spread of the epidemic. And this is both feasible and uh, it's easy to understand that from a thought experiment. The thought experiment goes as follows. People are infectious with this virus when they contract it generally for one to two weeks the thought experiment that everyone who is infected today is isolated, maybe in a quarantine facility, maybe safely in their own home. They get the food they need, but they don't infect other people. In principle, if this were done merely for a couple of weeks, unfortunately would die, ultimately, perhaps uh, after <laughs> a time in the hospital, but they would not infect the next wave of people because they've been successfully isolated. And the jargon is that the epidemic would be suppressed. So in that case, within just a few weeks, we'd be over with this. If the world were completely orderly, if public health were completely effective, I don't know what that is, <laughs> my phone ringing, uh, but if public health were completely effective, we would be past the epidemic phase in just a short period of time. If the whole world did that, uh, we'd look Uh, almost the whole world, to effective control. And when one looks around at what's actually happening in the world today, you see both sides of from on display. Remarkably and uh, effectively, 
the epidemic began in China, it has essentially stopped spreading except for very, very few local outbreaks that then are quickly controlled. Countries that have stopped the spread of the epidemic include China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Korea, Vietnam, Australia, New Zealand, probably Singapore, probably Japan. Large number of countries and very The epidemic. If you world scene, uh, Europe is not in good shape. The U.S. is not in good shape, or I should be more precise, Western Europe is not in good shape. Uh, there has been a mass epidemic in the U.K., Spain, France, Belgium, Italy. Uh, the U.S. hard hit the developing world in Africa and in much of Asia still at relatively low levels, but very precarious. Will they go the direction of Europe and the U.S. with a full-blown epidemic? Or will they be able to achieve the suppression of the infection as in the Asia-Pacific region? So not only is this a drama with very different possible outcomes, we're actually seeing right now in real time different outcomes uh, in the world. Most countries look inward. They just uh, discuss among themselves. But if we look comparatively, then we gain a much better understanding of what's happening. And we see that uh, it is possible to control this epidemic. Then we have to learn how the successful countries have done it so that we can apply the best practices to other places. Among those countries that you've identified as having an effective response, uh, can you illustrate the idea of systems thinking in, in the context of that response? How, how uh, do, do, does the effective response really underscore this idea of thinking in a more system-oriented way? Well, it Public health is a systems science, and the control of the epidemic is a public health challenge and success story in these successful countries. So this is definitely systems thinking. And the start of tends to infect more than one other person. Uh, we say that uh, those who are vulnerable to infection are susceptible uh, people. They're susceptible to infection. And the general estimate is that at the beginning of the COVID-19 epidemic in China, each infectious individual tended to infect 2.4 individuals on average. And you can see that leads to a chain reaction because the first person infects more than two others. Each one of those infect more than two others. Each one of those infect more than two others. And in fact, every three to four days, the number of in uh, it's and what we observed in early days in countries. Well, that number two. Production rate, and it's written as R0. And R0 is an important indicator for us uh, because it says that we have the risk of exponential or geometric growth. In other words, 
a doubling and then a doubling and then a doubling and then a doubling. So even a small number today can be a huge number in six weeks or eight weeks. That's indeed what happened in the United States. don't understand exponential doubling, like uh, Donald Trump said, well, we just have a few cases. What's the problem? We're a big country. But he didn't understand that if you double, then double, then double, then double, then double, then double, and you do that for a few weeks, every few days, you end up with the first uh, hundreds, then thousands, then tens of thousands, uh, then hundreds of thousands of cases, and a lot of dead people uh, in the end. And uh, the government just didn't understand that because they weren't systematic thinkers uh, in the United States. But when you think about that epidemic process, you're led to another concept called the uh, effective reproduction rate. The basic reproduction rate, which I mentioned, is what happens at the start of an epidemic. But once you apply policies and once you help people to behave more safely, then that number goes down. Uh, the reproduction number goes down. And the resulting number is not called the basic reproduction rate. It's called the effective reproduction rate. It says each day uh, how many people typically will be infected by an infectious individual. So the name of the game is to reduce the effective reproduction rate to less than one, because if each infectious individual infects fewer than one person or less than one person new, the epidemic goes away. If they infect more than one, then the epidemic grows. So the way that public health looks at this systematically is what can be done to reduce the effective reproduction number to below one. And there are two basic ways to do this. One is, or maybe I should say three basic ways to do this. The very inefficient way is you lock everyone up at home, tell them uh, you can't go out. And then if that is actually observed, uh, infections uh, don't go on. That's the idea of the lockdown. But boy, is that uh, difficult and expensive because everybody's locked down whether they're infectious or not. The, the other way to do this that uh, is the desirable way, if you can do it, is to only uh, isolate those who are actually infected or likely to be infected so they don't infect others while as those who are not infected go about their daily lives. You can see that's a, a much better balance if you can achieve it, uh, because then most of society goes about its daily life, whereas it's only those who are unlucky to be did and therefore infectious who are isolated and quarantined, but only for a couple of weeks if they're lucky enough to escape the worst outcome. So that's what public health is all about. Uh, it is about isolating the infectious people as early as possible, as soon as a symptom appears. In principle, you want that person to notify a public health official or get online or make a phone call or connect with an app and get tested. And then if the test is positive, to be in isolation. And if the public health is good, the health official will ask, well, who do you live with? Oh, you have a family at home. Uh, do you share a bathroom? Uh, uh, are you uh, in contact with each other? Oh, that's not good. We're going to move you temporarily to uh, a, a, a hospital ward that's been set aside for this or to a hotel room uh, that has been requisitioned as a quarantine facility or to uh, a, a sleeping site in a gymnasium that's been turned into a quarantine facility. You'll be safe but you'll also not infect other people, including your family members. So that's what quarantining is. And then the other point of public health is that even as infectious people do come into contact with others, or maybe they don't know that they're infectious yet because they're still pre-symptomatic, people take precautions by wearing face masks, by physical distancing, or the uh, authorities put temperature monitors in big buildings 
uh, so that uh, any worker that comes into an office building has a temperature taken and they're told, Mr. Jones, you actually have a fever. You must go home. You must uh, not come into contact with others and you will be tested as soon as possible. Uh, which, if the system is working well, as it did in Korea, would be very fast indeed. So the name of the game in public health control is systems thinking to stop those who are infectious or possibly infectious from infecting others. And one more point of systems thinking is that when an individual is found to be infected, the close contacts of those individuals are tracked down to be told, you have been in close contact at the workplace, at a restaurant, in a nightclub, at a theater, uh, in a train station, uh, in a bus seat, or uh, in your family setting, close to someone who is known now to have COVID-19. So you are also suspect as being quite likely to have the disease or quite possibly have it, you will be monitored for the moment you stay in isolation as well. Your temperature will be monitored and ideally you will be tested as well. So that's called contact tracing. This is what public health is about. Uh, it's not saying, oh, we like the economy, so just go about your business or we're going to lock everyone down uh, because we don't want to take risks. It's to be focused, systematic, uh, methodical, uh, very well organized. And uh, this is what a number of countries accomplished in East Asia, not perfectly, because it's not simple. Uh, and uh, you can be infectious without having symptoms. Uh, this makes it uh, very hard to control every outbreak in every case. But most people develop symptoms, and if you catch the symptomatic cases early enough, even though they may have infected uh, somebody uh, before becoming symptomatic, you reduce the effective reproduction rate dramatically, keep it below one, and allow daily life to continue. You uh, identified as uh, sort of best practices, uh, Southeast Asia, Korea, uh, they all have had some experience with respiratory borne illness before SARS, uh, swine flu, so forth. To what extent um, are they simply the beneficiaries of sort of having gone through this experience, you know, before the Western Europe and the United States? Uh, and to what extent are we, you know, uh, you know, needing to play catch up and, and having to do more uh, given where we started? There's no doubt that uh, SARS in 2003, which is also a coronavirus, uh, the same uh, family of virus uh, as COVID-19, also probably from uh, a bat reservoir uh, as the uh, source of the virus, uh, also a deadly uh, infection was uh, a, a kind of preparation for now. And so when countries in East Asia heard about this outbreak of a mysterious uh, pneumonia-like illness in Wuhan, China, as early as December 31st, 2019, many uh, went into high alert. Oh my God, SARS is back, or we have a serious problem. And so I'm sure that that played a role. And there have been several viruses, uh, uh, also uh, the uh, Middle East uh, uh, Respiratory Syndrome, uh, MERS, uh, which is uh, also a, a coronavirus uh, transmitted uh, via camel uh, to human population, uh, was a warning. H1N1 in 2009, which was a worldwide pandemic, was a warning to everybody in principle. The Nipah uh, outbreak uh, in uh, about five years ago was another warning. And incidentally, in the pandemic's literature among scientists, there were constant warnings. There will be coronavirus epidemics, not just epidemics, but coronavirus epidemics.
So no doubt the population knew that and the authorities knew that, and some countries were extremely well prepared. Taiwan, immediately. Uh, Singapore, immediate alert. Hong Kong, immediate alert. Korea, immediate alert. The truth is, we all should have been because we have in our governments in the US and Europe, uh, disease control agencies whose whole job it is to know these things and to keep us safe. In the United States, we have the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, which has the responsibility to uh, warn, make aware, and take steps, uh, emergency steps, when an outbreak occurs. We also, the world went through the uh, terrible cases of Ebola, though they were very few in number. That was also an alert uh, that uh, a disease outbreak uh, could uh, spread throughout the world through airplane travel and to be alert. What happened in the United States, though, which is still something of a mystery, which really will uh, generate a lot of close study uh, and uh, a lot of books and I hope exposés because there's a tremendous amount of malfeasance and incompetence uh, involved at the national level. The CDC was weakened by budget cuts and by the lack of attention in the Trump administration. And then we know from one whistleblower that uh, a professional 25 years of service exactly uh, in the uh, Department of uh, Health and Human Services that is charged with coming up with vaccines and therapeutic drugs in response to this kind of novel outbreak, saw the notice from WHO on December 31, uh, then the early days of January, and notified uh, the political superiors, we have a major crisis on our hands, we need to prepare. This is, in one sense, what America has, skilled, trained, highly professional people who are there exactly for the purpose to keep us safe. But the political system is broken in the United States. The top uh, cabinet officers, of course, are politically appointed. That's our system. They're not competent for their jobs. That unfortunately also became our system. And they became more and more, uh, especially in the current administration, lobbyists for corporations rather than professionals protecting us. So it happens that when this whistleblower tried to make the news known uh, in early January, he faced lobbyists not uh, public health professionals. Well, the upshot of it is we did not get prepared in the United States. The public didn't know. The governors and the mayors were not really uh, paying much attention. The president said we're completely safe, we're over it, uh, even though his intelligence agencies were telling him the contrary. And the result is that we had exponential growth of the epidemic from the early introductions in January, basically uh, until lockdowns spread across the United States uh, by the end of March, our effective reproduction number in the United States now is a little less than one probably because of the lockdown, meaning that we are containing the epidemic. But uh, many parts of the United States are going to go back to business as usual or almost business as usual in public policy terms. And it's very likely that the effective reproduction number will go above one sooner rather than later and epidemics will return. And many uh, also fear that we'll have a huge wave of uh, COVID-19 epidemic on top of a flu season next fall, which will be a double whammy to the hospitals once again, and the death rates will soar as a result. Question for you. Uh, how much do you blame this particular administration, and how much do you blame uh, 
sort of structural uh, uh, paralysis writ large. I mean, it's been said that uh, the American, you know, the modern form of American government may not be up to the task of some of these global challenges. And whether it's Donald Trump or Barack Obama or whoever comes next, uh, you know, no one would be in a position to adequately respond. Well, I put a, a lot of direct responsibility on the president, as Harry Truman said, when he was president, the buck stops here. Uh, it is literally the case that Trump was briefed and briefed again and briefed again and just ignored all the warnings. I don't think as a, a close observer of uh, governments all over the world for the last 40 years that uh, our president is actually capable of a systematic response. I'm sorry to say it. It's not a partisan statement. Mm -hmm. It's uh, just a, an analytical observation. I've dealt with heads of state all over the world for decades, and uh, this one is not up to the job. But there's also a more general problem, which is that the U.S. has not been effective at problem solving for a very long time. So uh, our systems are quite weakened. That's a systemic flaw because our politics uh, really did become uh, overwhelmed by corruption and money in politics, meaning that the idea of professionalism and expert systems took a backseat to political lobbying. So that's where I would put the structural problem. Mm. Uh, the structural problem is that when uh, the whistleblower went to uh, give the warning based on professionalism, uh, he faced lobbying instead of professionalism. And the result was uh, three months of lost time, which in the normal scheme of things isn't a disaster to lose three months. That's normal life. But when you're facing an exponential growth of an epidemic, it's the difference of stopping the epidemic and disaster. And we hit the disaster side of uh, of that balance instead of the uh, end of the epidemic. Now, we're going to move on to audience questions in just a minute or two, but I wanted to hit um, on the broad topic of cooperation, uh, global cooperation, something that you have been a party to, you have studied, you have observed. Uh, it is said, and it seems self-obvious, that this is a global problem. It will need a global uh, solution. Obviously, we're far from it. But if you would, perhaps you could sort of envision for us what types of cooperation, both at the global level and then even, you know, in the case of the United States, within, uh, you know, with, within the federal level and across states, what do you see as needed to set us on a course for control, if not eradication, at some point down the line? There are many, many dimensions uh, where we need global cooperation. Uh, the poorest country did economically, uh, as well as facing the risks of uh, rampant epidemics. So they need help to stay alive, to import food uh, and so forth. And that is a matter of global cooperation. Uh, when you have an epidemic uh, that, of course, can cross borders, uh, and, and reach the whole world uh, within hours or days, we're not safe if the epidemic is raging uh, out of control in any region. People move, uh, the virus moves with the people, and that's exactly what happened uh, in uh, the first weeks of this epidemic, and it will continue to happen. Uh, even with borders shut, there still is movement, there still is danger, or the borders being shut by itself is a huge cost to society. So if we want to go back to any semblance of normal life and getting jobs back and people going back to work, we actually have to have this epidemic controlled uh, to a large extent all over the world. That requires cooperation. That requires exchange of best practices. That requires uh, financing uh, for the poorest country. Uh, and so on. Uh, that requires making systems for safe travel, uh, for notifications, and so on. Uh, this is what the 
uh, UN system is designed to do, it's therefore profoundly troubling that in the midst of this, uh, the U.S. Uh, government, the Trump administration, uh, suspended funding for the World Health Organization, the very organization that is charged to do this. It did it under the claim that WHO is too close to China because part of controlling the epidemic is to try to put the blame on China. And that's a whole long story, but basically I think it's a diversionary tactic uh, of uh, politicians rather than uh, anything that is desirable or serious at the moment. This is not the time for blame, period. The specific charges that are being made against China, I believe upon very close study, are false or almost surely false or at least very likely to be false. Uh, and uh, having uh, this uh, kind of diplomatic war on China, if I could put it that way, maybe that's not the best expression, but these uh, verbal attacks, quite incendiary, that, that uh, China covered up the epidemic, that this was a, a release from a laboratory that China knew about but didn't tell the world, charges that I believe are false. To be doing this right now is deliberately to be undermining global cooperation. Unfortunately, that has been part of our politics for years because the Trump administration has uh, taken the U.S. out of many international agreements in recent years, such as the climate agreement or the agreement with uh, Iran on uh, the uh, nuclear systems and so forth. So this is part of that general strategy, uh, which you could call an us versus them strategy or an America first strategy. Uh, but it deeply undermines cooperation and global trust. And I fear that it is going to make this epidemic much longer lasting, much more insidious in its impacts, and it's going to hit the United States hard by prolonging uh, the depression uh, level uh, of unemployment that we already have in the United States. Well, that uh, is a perfect segue to our first audience question, which is quite ominously, are we headed toward or are we already in a depression? And how long do you foresee it would take uh, for the economy to recover from where we are currently? We're in a depression uh, because uh, effectively the unemployment rate has already hit 20%. It's not yet the headline. The headline is 14.7% uh, in April, the most recent reading. But if you read between the lines uh, and uh, look at what's happening uh, to new unemployment claims and to lost jobs and to people who have dropped out of the labor force, we're at about 20% unemployment right now. That is a depression. Uh, and there are two reasons to believe that uh, depression conditions will continue for quite a while. Uh, one is that we're not yet controlling the epidemic. Until we do, there will not be any kind of sustained recovery in the United States. Uh, the idea that we open up business because it's too costly to lock down, even though we haven't done the public health preparation, is a mistaken idea because life will not go back to normal. People will not go back to shopping. Uh, people will be in ill health. Uh, the social, economic, and health crisis will continue until we do the public health scale up. So this is one reason to believe that the impact will be prolonged. The other reason is that many of the jobs that are being lost right now are unlikely to recover. We're already in a transition for other reasons, but now greatly accelerated from a brick and mortar retail trade to e-commerce. So we were already in the shift from our local stores to Amazon and Walmart online. This has been tremendously accelerated. Millions of jobs are being lost in the retail sector, and I expect storefronts to be boarded up 
for years to come. Uh, shopping malls to be more empty than not. Many major retail chains are going bankrupt uh, almost on a daily basis now. Uh, brand names that we know and love uh, will not survive this epidemic. And there are other sectors as well that will not rebound. Construction will not come back soon because all of this empty commercial space. Uh, many uh, businesses uh, and uh, professional firms in New York City, my city, are saying, well, we're going to be working from home substantially. We don't have to spend uh, all that expensive money on uh, office rent in the future. And uh, our workers will come in maybe one or two days a week, but we don't need all this space that we've rented in uh, midtown office buildings. And that means that uh, office buildings are not going to be built uh, to the same amount. So construction jobs are going to be permanently lower or at least persistently lower and so on. All of this is to say we're in now for a pretty long haul uh, of uh, a uh, economic downturn. Our financial markets uh, are pretty frothy. They don't quite understand it. Uh, the stock market keeps on wanting to go up because the Fed keeps on putting in liquidity uh, into the money markets. But then every couple of weeks, they reassess and say, God, the news isn't good. How could stocks be so high? And then they retreat. And uh, the Fed uh, chairman, uh, Mr. Powell, uh, said recently, there's so much uncertainty and the situation remains uh, quite dire. I think he was being accurate. Uh, I think, in short, uh, we're in for a long haul. It would be a shorter uh, haul. Uh, if, uh, if, if the president knew what he were doing, uh, it would be a faster recovery. Uh, but it's going to be uh, quite a while to get out of this mess. Uh, next question touches on a couple of economic uh, concepts that I even recall from my undergraduate days. One is sort of Malthusian. Uh, is overpopulation a factor in this pandemic? And the second part of the question is, is there a limit to the number of people in a functional economy? Well, overpopulation is not really uh, a factor in this pandemic. What is a factor, clearly, uh, is that older people, survival, longevity, uh, turns out to create, of course, a group of uh, very vulnerable people. Most of the deaths <laughs> that are taking place are getting older. Still, they're losing a lot of good, viable, potentially very happy years of well-being. Uh, we shouldn't uh, say, well, it's old people. That would be horrific uh, in uh, our morals and ethics and common sense. But this is a, a disease that overwhelmingly is uh, uh, putting uh, older people at risk. We should be smart to therefore know that places where older people live, uh, in care centers, for example, in retirement homes, our highly vulnerable health system in the United States and in parts of Europe have been so deficient in this crisis that the virus has swept through hundreds of nursing homes, leading to massive numbers of deaths that were preventable. Uh, it's a tragedy. So this, I think, is the real demographic sense of uh, this virus. But incidentally, let me emphasize, as many people do, enough young people are dying, and the illness itself is uh, very harsh. For a lot of people who survive it, it's still a very tough illness, and it probably uh, is going to have many long-term consequences for some people who get infected. Uh, they survive, but with the uh, abilities, don't get it. Uh, we should be stopping this epidemic. Uh, then on the question of uh, uh, how many people uh, can, uh, you know, can Earth support or can a society support, uh, there is a, a reason to hope that through the voluntary, smart uh, choices of fertility by people around the world, by households, 
that we would level off in population, not by death of famine or disease by the four horsemen of the apocalypse or by war, but rather by uh, a voluntary uh, reduction of fertility rates to what's called replacement levels. That is, if on average uh, uh, households have uh, two children, uh, that means they replace themselves. Uh, it's almost like that epidemic calculation of getting an effect of R equals one. Well, it's the same principle basically in population growth. If uh, every two uh, people in a couple uh, have uh, an average of two children or statistically slightly more than two to take into account uh, child mortality, uh, it's uh, what's called the replacement rate. The population stabilizes. That would uh, actually help the earth itself and help the people living on it because all of the challenges of deforestation, of uh, feeding the planet, of uh, energy, which unfortunately, when it comes in the form of fossil fuel, uh, has created the climate crisis, uh, all of that would be easier to address uh, with fertility rates uh, around replacement level rather than at very, very high rates. This is not the story of this epidemic, but it is a story about uh, sustainable development more generally. Uh, we were coming up on the hour, so only have time for a couple of more questions. So I'm going to sort of uh, shift us in a more positive, hopeful <laughs> uh, direction as we close out. Um, one audience member wants to know, uh, you've described this ro robust public health uh, system, what we need to effectively intervene uh, and, and stop this virus that we're not doing currently. How do we bring that about? What is the role of individuals as citizens, individuals sitting in their houses and apartments quarantined at the moment, what can they do to bring that reality to bear faster? Well, uh, as citizens, we should be saying, even yelling to our mayors, uh, to our governors, and to the president of the United States, public health, public health, public health. Uh, that's what we have been missing. That's what we need. We need testing, tracing, quarantining, isolating, face masks, thermal monitoring, protection. This is what we need. And so as citizens, we should be saying this loud and clear. As individuals, we should be taking care both uh, not to become infected, it's horrible, and also not to infect others. If we are unlucky enough to become infected, we think we have symptoms, uh, we know that we're living in a house with someone that has been sick. Uh, please take care not to be part of that uh, epidemic uh, infection process. Uh, find a safe place to isolate. Get the help that you need to isolate safely. But uh, it is called public health because it's not something that individuals privately can do by themselves. Public health is a public function of government. And we really need that public function of government to step in the coming weeks so that we can shorten the time of the epidemic, the loss of life, and the economic pain that goes along with it. It's almost as if the public health system got lost in the debate around public health care writ large and and you know in in the face of that battle still raging we've completely ignored this other component of what keeps us collectively well it's very interesting that you say that because there's a lot of confusion of health care which is uh, mainly facilities and hospitals and public health services which is very little to do with hospitals but is out in the community. And so there's a big confusion about this. You can't fight an epidemic in the hospitals. You can keep some people alive, but you don't stop the exponential growth of the infection in a hospital or in facilities or by doctors for that matter. You do it by health workers who are testing, contact tracing, supporting isolation, uh, supporting services to enable people 
to uh, self-isolate. And that is a difference of a hospital system and a public health system. And very few people understood that analytical difference at the beginning of this. And I think that that is part of our problem, actually. Mm. This uh, last question, and then we're going to have to wrap up, uh, addresses the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which you helped to author and bring uh, you know, onto the world stage. Question asks, how will the UN Sustainable Development Goals be impacted by COVID-19, uh, both uh, in terms of achieving them, but also might there be any revisiting of them in light of COVID-19? Most importantly, uh, the idea of the Sustainable Development Goals is to have a world that is prosperous, inclusive, so everybody gets to share in the prosperity, and sus environmentally sustainable. In fact, the SDGs will give us a kind of roadmap for building after this epidemic. We're going to have hundreds of millions of uh, unemployed people around the world. They should be putting in the new renewable energy systems, the clean grid, uh, the new <coughs> universal access uh, to uh, broadband services, the retrofitting of buildings uh, to be safer and more energy efficient. There'll be plenty of good jobs to do. The SDGs will point the way at a building in a way that's safe for the world, uh, not building in a way that's going to lead to new crises of climate change or loss of biodiversity or new emerging diseases. So the SDGs can be our roadmap. Well, thank you so much, Professor Sachs, uh, for joining us. It is such an honor to have had this time with you today. Um, I, I have my thought pleasure. on more than one occasion, on more than one occasion uh, it has occurred to me that the world, our situation would be radically different right now if you were in the White House or anywhere near it. Uh, so I very much appreciate yeah. you sharing your thought. Well, let's hope that someone in the um, White House is uh, watching Big Think. That would be good. <laughs> Uh, not likely. <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> thank you very uh, much. And to all of you at home, uh, I, I just want to thank you all for joining. Uh, and as a reminder, if you enjoyed this webinar, please join us next Tuesday at 1.30 for a conversation with former Navy SEAL uh, Brent Gleason on leadership, resilience, and leaning into adversity, moderated by Nathan Rosenberg, a founding partner of the consultancy Insignium and a former Naval officer himself. Uh, once again, thank you all for joining us and be well. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you again.